All right, so we got Austin Ingram here based out of San Antonio, Texas. What's going on, Austin? Not much. How about you? Nothing, man. I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate you being on the show today. I'm excited to talk to you uh, for a lot of reasons, but selfishly, I don't get to talk to a lot of people who are dabbling in real estate all across the country who are also hunting and fishing all the time. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> when yeah, you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. When did you develop the passion for the outdoors? Most people happen at a pretty young age. Yeah, pretty much born with it. I mean, we're an outdoors family. So since day one, you know, I was being taken in the outdoors until I could go on my own. So as long as I could remember. That's pretty awesome, man. Same here. My uh, my dad grew up hunting. My grandpa grew up hunting on my dad's side. Now, my mom's side, they don't even know how to operate a gun, which uh, yeah. blows my mind. <laughs> <Especially> <laughs> they live in Georgia. It's like you got to know how to operate a gun if you live in the South. Yeah, for you know? sure. But they don't know how to. Um, but we were the same way, man. Grew up uh, deer hunting, duck hunting later in life. We didn't duck hunt. We're just not in a flyway here in South Carolina. No, right. It's You can get on the coast. Now, if you go by the coast – you can run into some ducks, but where I live, man, you get up, we'll hunt, get in the woods at whatever time, six o'clock, call it. Woody's will fly right at daybreak. Yeah, and then if, then it's dead. Like I'm, I promise. So you may get 20 Woody's that come over. You may get a hundred and you know them, like they're quick, like real quick. And you're not going to get them to land like you do mallards. And so mallards may not fly if they're going to fly at all to like nine. So yeah, it's like, yeah. okay, you're done shooting woodies at six thirty tops. Do you want to sit here for another two and a half hours and maybe, maybe you get five or six mallards? So most of the time we're pretty lazy with it and we just go to Waffle House and and yeah. eat breakfast, <laughs> breakfast and leave it up. But are y'all near I a flyway? Have, oh yeah, I mean <laughs> I've always said Texas is like I wouldn't say it's a secret, but we have a super long waterfowl scene. And in my opinion, it's almost always good from start to finish. Wow. You know, like it's good enough to be, to have a good time early season. And then late season, usually it's just super stacked from, you know, Panhandle to South Texas. We can, might shoot goose feeds. I got like 10, 20,000 geese in it. Or, you know, you want to shoot puddle ducks. They'll be all over central Texas, plenty at the coast. Um, I think it's awesome. Wow. So it, it's, but I got some friends who I met through real estate, uh, are from Carolinas. And so I know all the stories about just shooting woodies and <laughs> pretty much nothing else. So, uh, I'm familiar with it. Yeah. It's brutal, man. That's cool. Y'all are, yeah, y'all are a good kept secret over there. Cause everybody on, like on our side of the country talks about Arkansas. That's where everybody yeah. goes. We all go to Arkansas. If we want to hunt goose hunt, duck hunt, you name it. But the fact that y'all got birds coming in in Texas is is pretty cool. We may have to like edit oh, yeah, that part cool. out. That way people don't start coming and <laughs> yeah. hunting, hunting y'all's spot. Well, that's cool, man. Well, um, so obviously, you know, we'll tie the outdoors in throughout this entire episode because that's a, a huge factor uh, in your life and in decisions you made. But, um, you know, before we get to that, I want to talk about college so you majored in entrepreneurship but let's take it back before then what made you go that route and choose entrepreneurship as a major because that's pretty specific and not everybody uh has that entrepreneurial spirit sure yeah so uh, my father's a gc or general contractor here in the san antonio Hill country area and he's always been a builder since i was born and in construction <clears throat> He's owned that company since 86. And I think that I kind of just picked up off of it from osmosis. And because my entrepreneurial journey started way before college, um, in high school, I had, so my first passion was photography. And then I liaison on that into a photography business, doing like senior pictures and stuff for friends. And then I started a landscape company that was pretty successful for like a 17 year old. Um, and then after I graduated high school, since I was hunting all the time anyway, um, I decided, well, I was hunting waterfall on public land and I said, well, I might as well take people with me. So I started a little outfit running a bunch of hunts during my freshman year of college on private or public land on public, on land. public land. Wow. That's cool. And, uh, and it just kind of was trickle down theory from there, like just snowballed into more things and then bigger things. And then, you know, I got busy with school and then just wrapped that into my studies. 
And then it progressed into other businesses and then essentially into real estate. Wow. That's cool. It's it's so neat to see people who have that entrepreneurial spirit at a young age. I uh, am oftentimes on your side of the camera on these podcasts and people are asking me questions. Hey, where did your you know, hustle come from your drive, your entrepreneurial spirit. And, uh, mine's the same way I saw it with my dad, but it's, it's kind of funny in my scenario, my dad's a pastor. So people are like, your dad's a pastor. How, how do you, you know, how'd you get that entrepreneurial spirit? Well, he's decided to start his church at 32 years old, you know, started his own church from the ground up, um, you know, with nobody essentially. And now it probably runs over a thousand people and watching him build going from renting a building in Anderson, South Carolina, where one of the high schools actually to going through a building project and then another building project and then growing office staff. And it's, it's interesting how that upbringing and just seeing whether our parents are talking to us about it or not. I don't remember dad sitting down and saying, all right, son, this is what it's like to be an entrepreneur, <laughs> you know, but, oh, yeah. but, but seeing those pioneer, um, you know, qualities in our parents, uh, it's pretty cool. And I don't know about you, but the entrepreneur life is exhilarating. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. I mean, it's exhausting, <laughs> but definitely exciting. And it's, it's worth every bit of time put into it. That's cool. So we were talking about hunting, obviously at the beginning, because that's a huge passion of yours. And so you graduate college. Uh, where'd you go by the way? Uh, Texas state, Texas state. Cool. So you graduate Texas state with a degree in entrepreneurship and for a lot of folks, it takes a long time to figure out what your passions are and what you want to do in life and then build a life around that. You said, heck no, from the get go, you wanted to be able to hunt and fish whenever you wanted to essentially, <laughs> yeah. essentially. And so you went into a career in the commercial appraisal space, which you're not a commercial appraisal, but you worked in a commercial appraising company that allowed you to be able to hunt and fish whenever you wanted to. So how did you, yeah. How did you, at such a young age, know, hey, I want to design my life to where I do what I love, but I still got to make some income? How, how'd that process go? Well, you know, in college, I had these different businesses that were in different industries. Um, they were kind of like, I guess, a mixture between business dreams and hobbies and passions. And then some of them didn't necessarily take off because I was working on through college until my last semester. And then life started, right? You know, I needed a career money coming in. So I'd interviewed with a handful of corporate jobs and uh, there were some, some awesome companies and some, some really good opportunities. But this one, this one interviewer, the guy, I think that maybe had woken up on the wrong side of the bed. And at that point I was like, I'm just going all in on my own. And so I had had a buddy in college and we waterfowled a lot together, hunted waterfowl a lot. His dad was a commercial appraiser and a broker. And we were always talking about just kind of living the life we wanted to live, but still understanding that we need to work hard. Um, and he said, why don't you come interview with my dad? And I sat down with him and I told him straight up, I said, I'm not afraid of super long hours. I'm not afraid of working as hard as I can. I just want to have the flexibility to hunt and fish whenever I want. Straight up. And he said, well, that's totally cool with me. If you hit your deadlines, I don't care where you are, when you, when you doing the work, just hit the deadlines and you can hunt and fish whenever you want. So that year I just had a ton of flexibility, worked super long hours, you know, worked till midnight every night, but took off as much as I want I mean, fishing. So then that turned into getting my real estate license and being a retail agent, juggling both. Um, so that I could kind of maximize the opportunity for the time that I had put it in. And that obviously gave me more flexibility in between, you know, grinding all the time. Um, and then eventually into full time and real estate investments. That's wow. how it started. That is awesome, man. Good for you for for knowing what you want and not not giving uh, in. Thanks. Like you said, you had the the big job offers and you could have been the corporate Kathy. Um, but I guarantee <laughs> you, man, maybe you make more money you know, the last couple of years, if you do that, but you're not as happy. And yeah, no doubt, you know, the fact that you're able to do both, what's it like putting those disciplines in place? Like what, what works for you? Because a lot of people say, man, it'd be hard for me to operate with structure, you know, without structure like that, without somebody telling me I have to be in the office at this time, must be doing, 
you know, this type of work. What's uh, what's been good for you to be able to stay on track and do what you want, but still achieve those numbers, uh, you know, in the business world? You know, it's there's a lot of truth in that, like in the the need for having structure, because I think all of us probably as entrepreneurs find a time where we are looking to increase efficiency because we're lacking that structure um, from somebody else anyway. So I think what kept me in line was just finding others and seeing the processes they're doing and kind of trying to replicate them to increase that, that, that structure that I needed or was lacking from other places, because it's true, you know, we can all, we all feel, I think the pressure to work probably 7 AM to midnight or all the time because it never really turns off. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I was looking for ways to structure a little bit better, I would bounce ideas off of other people, see what their day looks like, try to emulate it, um, and help that increase my efficiency in my, in my productivity. That's really cool, man. You obviously have been absolutely crushing it because you're still living the life you want and you got income coming in and now you know, <laughs> you, you're running your own business with real estate. Um, so that's really cool. So you make that transition to real estate. Uh, your dad had been a GC, a general contractor your whole life. You've been working in this commercial appraisal office. What, I mean, you got some influences there, obviously. Um, yeah. but what made you to say, okay, um, you know, just on the investment side first, we don't even talk about the realtor side first. What made you say, all right, I want to go and buy investment real estate. Who had that impact on you? Well, actually a really close friend of mine, uh, Corey Thompson. And when I was working in appraisal, Corey was jumping into real estate investments and he had been in oil and gas before that. He wanted to know all about mobile home park appraisals and RV park appraisals. And I was doing a lot of those and somehow I saw him online and we connected and started talking about it. And then I wanted to get into more investment space stuff because I guess I wanted to control my time and my fate a little bit more. Right. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as a retail agent, you can chase around buyers forever. And they might not buy a house. So <clears throat> I was focused on that for a while. Um, drug my feet for a couple of years, just kind of having some, you know, analysis paralysis Yeah, and finally jumped into, but he is the one who kind of ignited the flame in me that I wanted to, to get started buying properties. Um, and I still do, you know, retail stuff every now and then, but he kind of ignited the flame in me to get going and, and get my, get hit the ground running. That's really cool. So what was, um, you know, you had, you had Corey who gave you that nudge, obviously to say, Hey, let's get this thing started. Where did you dive in next to take your knowledge even farther? Was it strictly Corey? Did you start reading certain books, podcasts? Where did you, where'd you get that knowledge from? You know, I started just kind of paying attention to a lot of online education um, and then watching what he was doing and other people in that kind of space were doing. Um, and down here in Texas, there's a, that's pretty tight knit community of investors. Like, you know, you start kind of realizing who's who and who the players are and learning from them. And I actually, I drug my feet, like I mentioned, for like two years mm -hmm. saying, I want to get into real estate investment, but just thinking I needed the perfect opportunity to do it. So I never did it. Um, <clears throat> but the next step for me was after those two years and after a lot of push and shove, a lot of people, you know, being like, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. The next physical step was I just started implementing some marketing because the one thing that everybody was telling me was just take action, right? Which a lot of us hear. And it's what I wasn't doing. I was learning and learning, but I wasn't taking any action. So deployed some marketing and just started kept deploying it. And then after that, you know, first deal came, then the second, the next one, and never stopped. That's really cool. So there's a lot of people listening to this who are going to be struggling to paralysis by analysis. I have talked to so many people, my buddies of mine, they've been telling me for years, hey, next year, I got to get this done, then next year. Uh, one or two tips to, to help somebody get across that that jump. I would say, you know, I know we all hear it. And I, I remember hearing it and being like, what are y'all talking about? Is just do something. Because it doesn't matter if it's small or big, like 
doesn't matter if it's picking up the phone and calling and asking for help. Just do something because that one action will lead to the next. It'll naturally give you some, in, you know, release some endorphins that might get you to the next step. Yep. And then it'll just be trickled down from there. So, like, you don't necessarily have to jump into mailers if you don't know anything about them and you're scared about spending the money. Just pick up the phone and call somebody and say, hey, can I be quiet all day and follow you around? Anything. <laughs> Anything. You know? Whatever wherever the inspiration is going to come from to take one step, just do that. That's great advice. And there's so many things you can do. I mean, if we even narrow this down even farther, like you said, you can reach out to another investor. Hey, can I follow you around? You can join local real estate groups that meet in person. You can get on local online groups. You can join a, a coaching group and community. There are so many different ways you can listen to podcasts. There are so many different things that you can like steps you can take to kind of overcome that paralysis by analysis without even ever buying a property. And then when we go to buy that property, if you're still stuck, you guys got to remember, you don't have to hit grand slams every time, right? Yeah. Baseball analogy, singles, singles, singles. And then every now and then, maybe you hit a triple, maybe you hit a double, you hit that home run. Um, but if we load up with enough singles, we're going to score a lot of points and build a lot of wealth um, over yeah, time. Yeah. So you said you implemented marketing. What'd that look like for you? There's a lot of different yeah. ways we can go with marketing. How'd you do it? Yeah, so my first marketing was bandit signs. Nice. Explain and to everybody so, what know, a bandit sign is, what yours look like. and So bandit signs are, you know, corrugated plastic signs that you might see out on the road on the corner that say, I buy houses or we buy houses. And obviously you need to be familiar with the rules and laws around them um, because they can be against some city ordinances. Uh, but they're just a great way to have inbound marketing that equals typically pretty warm results. So mine were yellow, black letters, I buy houses, cash, quick closing. And uh, that was the lifeblood of the beginning of my business. Did your phone just blow up? No, I would say no. And I was hustling. Like I was working all day long in a day job, working some construction in San Antonio. And I was putting out bandit signs at night. And I would get a handful of calls, you know, on Saturday and Sunday. I wouldn't say it was ringing off the hook because <clears throat> I think I'd average 200 signs a weekend, which is pretty a pretty good number if you're by yourself mm -hmm. uh, for each evening. But the calls that I did get were super hot. Wow. That's awesome. And you didn't spend... You guys, I hope you are listening to this. He didn't spend at this time getting started thousands on mail outs right away or thousands on digital marketing. This dude got these <laughs> signs built with stakes that he just put in the ground and uh, probably didn't cost you much money at all, I guess. No, no. I, I think I usually would get it down to with stakes like mm, a buck 90 a piece or so. Wow. So, you know, it took a little bit of money, but. It wasn't like I needed 5,000 mailers to go out at once. Yep. And plus, it was easy for me to, you know, kind of finance it, if you will, because by yourself, you can only do so many. So mm -hmm. if you're putting out 100, I'd say 100 a week, you know, you need a couple hundred bucks a week. And I know that that, that can be tough for, for some people, but you don't have to buy it all at once. Yep. And you only need one to cover all that marketing for a long time. Yeah. And then once you get them out there, I mean, they're there and then you can just move them. Can you not? You can just move them around. Yeah. Well, it, it, it depends. Yeah. Usually you can, um, but they'll just collect, keep collecting traffic, you know, like just like a billboard basically. That's awesome. Now, what type of calls were you getting? Was it mostly distressed buyers, somebody who was in trouble? Yeah, pretty much all distressed or sellers. buyers. I so said like, buyers, sellers. Sorry about that. Sellers. Yeah. I've, I actually, I've never chased any sort of like pre-foreclosure leads and I've never had to work with any. Almost all my calls are going to be like, you know, just a physically distressed property or an inherited property or an, another property we have and we just can't keep up with it. That's really cool. And those are solid leads when people like oh, that yeah. are calling you, like you were saying, that's not, it's not like you're cold calling and I talked to a guy the other day. He said it took him, I think, 48 hours, 43 to 48 hours of cold calling for one deal. 
That's oh. I don't have time for that, nor do I want yeah. to make time for that. But you're saying you got Bandit Science put out and immediately, you know, I'm sure there's junk mixed in, but you're getting some pretty qualified callers, uh, people who need help. Like you said, people may have inherited a home or another investor who's just like, hey, we're tired of dealing with this one. Take it off our hands. And that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, they turned out pretty good. It, that first year of mine, I did six deals and five out of six were from Bandit Science. Wow. And they were very good. That's cool. So what are you doing with these properties? You have these leads come in. So your marketing, when you're starting out, are bandit sides. Once you get them, what are you doing with them? Are you buying and holding them? Are you fixing and flipping them or wholesaling? Or like we talked about before the show, wholesaling, what's, what's your method? And then how do you choose what you're going to do with them if you have multiple methods that you're, that you're employing? Well, so, you know, I don't want to dismiss this. I was very fortunate to get in in the investment side of things at one of the you know best markets in the country, right? January 2020 was really when I jumped into it full time, which was just before COVID. And, you know, we all know things were just like crazy after that. Mm-hmm. So if you're buying, you know, when you're buying just discounted properties, like I hate to say this, but it was going to sell, you know, if the numbers are right and you knew what you were doing, like you're going to move the property. I think, you know, I didn't have any trouble selling properties uh, that were distressed, but you know, obviously I credit that to my appraisal background some because of being accurate with numbers. But the first deal I ever did, I assigned it, but my plan was never to wholesale real estate. So tell them what that is. Uh, Break that down real quick. Uh, what an assignment is. So I put the property under contract um, and I sold the equitable interest to another end buyer in the form of selling him the paper contract. Yep. So the ability to or the right to close on it. Exactly. Uh, you guys will hear this in a lot of different episodes. A lot of people got their start in real estate this way where they put a property under contract and all Austin did was sell that contract to somebody else. Somebody said, I'll pay you $5,000 to take that contract or whatever the number was to take that contract over. He sells the person that contract and now he's out of that deal. He just made $5,000 essentially in cash and he can go out and find the next deal. Yeah. Yeah. And then after that is when I focused on what I've always focused on and that was wholesale. So wholesale is, um, you know, the word is a mixture of wholesale and retail is you're buying a discounted property, closing on it, listing it on the retail market, just clean it out, clean it up, list it. You don't need to flip it. You know, I mean, some, some of them might clean up a little bit better than others just to make them more presentable, but not fully cosmetically flipping them. And the reason why I did that, um, and I still do that a lot, is that because I was buying deals, fortunately, that were so discounted that I wanted to protect the transaction and control the asset. So I might buy deals at like 30, 40 cents on the dollar. And because of that, instead of wholesaling it and kind of going through that nimble process, I just said, you know what, I'm going to close on it, control the asset, I'm going to sell it as the owner. Interesting. And you have seen that your margins on selling at retail have been, has been worth you controlling the asset and selling yes. that way. And the reason why is because, well, typically is one, in my opinion, when you're wholesaling, which is a great, you know, a great way, a great business, um, you're one more person in the transaction basically. And in the wholesale model, when you put on MLS, which is the biggest pool of buyers in the world, you have, let's just say for round numbers, 10 times more eyeballs, which creates 10 times more competition, which creates higher prices because there's more demand. So you're usually getting offers that are astronomically bigger, in my opinion, because uh, a lot of those people maybe don't have the time or the processes to uh, source their own deals. So they're buying off the MLS. So just naturally through the process, the prices are a little bit higher. And then if for some reason you need to get rid of a property, maybe it's sitting longer, whatever, you could go back and potentially wholesale that to another investor, take a little bit less on the cut, but you have that as a safety net, correct? Well, I couldn't wholesale the contract because I already closed on it. That's true. That's true. But I mean, I can sell it for- Discount. Yeah, a lot less. And when there was so much traffic on the MLS through it, you know, I'm still going to make something. Yeah. 
That's awesome, man. I love that strategy. Wholetailing. So we got wholesaling, which is essentially you're selling contracts, but Austin's saying he puts these properties under contract, closes on them, owns the properties, and uh, then turns around and lists them on the MLS after getting them cleaned up. But he's not doing a full flip. So this is a, no. this is a pretty awesome strategy. How are you going about funding for these? This is a big question everybody has. How do you fund these projects? So when I first started out, I was super unfamiliar with how to do all this stuff if you didn't have the liquid cash to close on everything. My buddy Corey said, it was the first deal that I got. It was a monster, or the second deal. It's a monster deal. And he said, no, nah, man, you got to close on this. It's too good of a deal. So he got me hard money. He got me set up, taught me how it works. Um, I closed on it, you know, and was $0 out of my pocket, 100% funding. Wow. And listed it. So I've always kind of followed that process until a little bit more recently where I got, you know, into private money and stuff. Mm-hmm. Is I close on everything with hard money, $0 out of my pocket. And I'd list it and sell it. That's awesome. That is awesome. That's such a big hurdle from for a lot of folks to, you know, to overcome with the lending. I, I will say you don't have to say the company's name. Do you know of hard money lenders who are still doing a hundred percent? Oh yeah, I do. Some of them. That's cool. I know you know it can be harder as a as a beginner investor. Just the ones I've talked to, uh, a lot of times if it's a newbie, they want you you know to put down fifteen percent, maybe ten percent, and then as you progress, uh, they'll loan out a hundred percent. But even at that, even if you got a hard money lender giving you you know ninety percent of purchase and any rehab you have to do, and you got to go find ten percent, you know maybe from a private lender, or buddy, whatever the case may be, that still beats having to put twenty twenty five percent down on a on a property. So yeah, um, I agree. Yeah, no, that's. I was fortunate in the beginning, though, that the deals were so deep. And I had colleagues who had relationships with lenders who would vouch for me and say, you know, we know he understands what he's doing. Uh, here's the deal, it's really deep. So obviously, we mitigated the, ri- mitigated the risk as much as possible. And that got me into the position of being able to get 100% financing early on. That's awesome. Guys, if you can get 100% financing, which I preach, I teach our students, we want to try and buy as many real estate deals as possible without using any of our own money. There are so many avenues to leverage somebody else's money to buy real estate. There's really no good reason that we should be spending our own money. Uh, And it really, really, really increases our ROI, our return on investment. Um, substantially when we're not using our own dime. So learn how to do it. Listen to, to, to folks like these, reach out to folks like Austin and, and, and pick their brain because it is, it is a game changer when you learn how to buy real estate and you build those relationships where you're not having to put your own money in because eventually you're going to run out. I've told this story a bunch of times on podcasts is the first two deals I bought I used my own money. So it was 20% down, which was like 15 grand each, and then another $20,000 in rehab. Well, next thing you know, after two properties, I'm all, you know, I got fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 in the deal and I'm out of money. And I was like, dang, I just started too. And I bought them like within three months of each other. And I, I'm thinking I'm doing good. I've got these two properties. I'm like, holy crap, I can't buy anything else. Yeah. And uh, that was kind of the, the, the light bulb moment for me that said, uh, all right, we got to figure out another way to do this. And, uh, you know, I, I think me and you both have realized the power of utilizing somebody else's money to grow a portfolio and, and to flip properties, hotel, whatever it may be. Oh, yeah, definitely. And the one thing that I always followed religiously was that uh, I don't buy anything over 70% of ARV minus the repairs. So I don't squeeze into deals. You know, I'm, I find some that I like. And if they're just over my rule, I just let them go, man. So I'm on, I'm going to dig into that for a second. That way everybody knows exactly what you're talking about. All right. So sure. ARV, um, and, and you can pop in here too. ARV is going to be the after repair value. So sure. Austin is going and finding what are these properties going to be worth? Should he fix them up? And how do you go about that? You were worked in the appraisal business. What's your method yeah. for finding that out? You know, I'm pretty meticulous about my numbers especially when it comes down to conversations about like, you know, a lot of people get into price per square foot and stuff. So, um, you know, I run comps on all kinds of stuff like Propelio, PropStream, you know, bounce things off of other platforms. But at the end of the day, I pull all my comps off MLS. I put them on a grid 
and I adjust them out just like an appraisal kind of, at least for square footage. And so I try to be really, really laser focused on my, on my ARVs and what I think it'll, it'll, it'll finish out at. So I just, to answer your question, I get the comps that I know fit the criteria that would work in an appraisal because I'm selling at retail at the end of the day. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and even though most of the buyers on MLS who are buying my properties are cash buyers or investors, sometimes they use conventional financing. So there might be an appraisal involved. So grab my comps, adjust them out, make sure that the finished outs are comparable. Um, and then I kind of bounce them off other programs to see if we're in the same ballpark. And then once I do that, I reconcile the numbers and I, I come up with a number that I think is really accurate and honest. That's really cool. And so like, if you're looking for a three bed, two bath, or that's the property that you're looking at, you're going to try and pull comps, you know, in a couple mile radius for three bed, two bath, somewhere similar square footage, if possible. And then you're just taking them, putting, obviously we do this with multiple ones, but you'll take the property you're looking at, choose a property, and then you'll just kind of mix and match and see, okay, how nice is this property? You know, uh, is the kitchen fully renovated? Are the bathrooms fully renovated? Are the floors brand new? You know, does this particular property have a, a garage and the one that I'm looking at doesn't? And, and you'll base your numbers, um, you know, kind of going item by item like that. Oh yeah, absolutely. So like, you know, they got stone countertops or any type of stone. Then we're going to use stone comps. Mm-hmm. They got new floors, new paint, you know, configuration, um, new roof, new AC. So take all those, those specific line items into account. And then you would subtract if yours didn't have certain features yeah, that the comp has. Yeah. So the way I do it, you know, like on an Excel spreadsheet or adjustment grid, is I'm going to make an adjustment for that finish out quality. So, you know, fortunately, and you don't have to be in construction to know this, but <clears throat> you can make a pretty, pretty accurate adjustment on, let's say, if you needed to make an adjustment for countertops. And, you know, there's like 50 square foot of countertops and it's just for round numbers, it's 10 bucks a foot or something. You know, you can make that $5,000 adjustment. Hopefully that, that math is correct. Um, you can make that $5,000 adjustment uh, if you need to, uh, because I've had houses where I listed that the numbers were so close together that you could derive the exact cost of the houses that were just missing stone countertops from the other comps that had it. Wow. So just allocate the construction costs and adjust it out if you need to what, that- or adjust it up or down. Yeah, up or down. Exactly. Now, me and you've yeah. been doing this a while. You were in the appraisal business, so I, we can probably just look at something and tell you what the cost is going to be. We're gonna, we can be pretty darn close. Yeah. What would you recommend for somebody who can't do that yet? I, I, we, I have an app that all of our students use called Flipper Force. It gives you the cost of what, um, you know, material and items are going to be. Uh, but, but what would you tell folks to do who are newer and can't just eyeball it? So what I did actually, truthfully, was <clears throat> utilize the idea that some suppliers can be cheaper than others. For example, um, you know, you can buy stuff at Walmart cheaper than you might find it other places for the same product. And even though Home Depot and Lowe's are kind of, let's just say they're your everyday home improvement stores, a lot of GCs will still go to these stores because Home Depot and Lowe's have the buying power to have pretty awesome prices on some items. Yep. So, What I would really do is initially I started, I would get quotes from everybody on everything and then I'd break it down price per square foot. So if I had the time, I'd say, Hey, I got this house, call a painter, I need a full interior paint, baseboards and doors. You know, how much would it cost me for labor only, if you will. They might say it's this much and then I'll break it down price per square foot. See how much paint I need, break it down price per square foot. And then, then I got my paint costs. If I had stuff that wasn't that easy to call, like a I couldn't call a, a subcontract easily, I might price things out straight from like Home Depot or Lowe's online. Hey, I need a bathtub. What's this bathtub going to cost me? Um, or call a showroom and get a price on it. And initially how I started was I just call, I'd put the work in, called who I needed to, asked them the price, broke it down to price per square foot on the spreadsheet, and 
I just kept track of it. And then I built that spreadsheet out and I use it on every property from there forward. Wow. Dude, this is absolute gold. Uh, the amount of complaints or questions I get from people saying, I don't know what things cost. I don't know how to comp homes. How do I know what, how much my rehab's going to be? Uh, guys, all you have to do is put the work in. If you will reach yeah. out to contractors, reach out to uh, supply stores, see what the cost is going to be, see what the labor is going to be, break it down, boom, you have your cost right there. Some of these things take work on the front end. All these things pretty much take work on the front end. <laughs> yeah. But if you will do the work, you will get better over time. And like you said, Austin's got a spreadsheet built out now. And so he has, boom, I know exactly what I'm looking for. He's probably keeping tabs on what labor rates are. You can look up and see where material rates have changed. And it makes it for such a smooth process. Again, uh, the, an app that I, that we use is Flipper Force. And it's a lot like what you're talking about, um, Austin, that you build out manually, which is great. There's a ton of ways to skin this cat. So either way, if you don't have your own spreadsheet yet, you can start at Flipper Force and it'll give you a whole list of items that um, you can look up and, and, and get those calls. So however you got to do it, uh, put the work in because it is imperative that you analyze and underwrite properties correctly. You know, purchase price, rehab, all of that. If not, you're going to end up burning yourself in the long run and you're going to get stuck with a lemon. And I don't want anybody uh, in my circle who's listening to my podcast, my content to get stuck with a bad property. So dude, that is absolute gold right there. Um, what is your sweet spot for properties? What are you looking for? So for me, for example, I'm looking for B to C class neighborhoods. That's where I sit. Uh, I can make a little bit of cash flow. Tenants should pay my down my debt. I'm gonna get appreciation over time. What uh, what are you looking for? Bed, bath, area, all that. You know, mine's not so cut and dry. <clears throat> like I'm obviously, well, I'm very familiar with San Antonio because I grew up here, but I'm also real familiar with a lot of places in Texas because I live in Austin, lived in Fort Worth and I sold real estate in all of them. And so I'm real familiar with just like majority of the neighborhoods, majority of the towns in the outskirts. And I've always kind of focused in a lot of the rural areas too, because a lot of people focus on inner city. Yep. Um, but for me, it's really like, there are some neighborhoods, you know, that I'll be like, I'll buy everything in there. Uh, but there are very few neighborhoods that I'll say I won't buy in there if the numbers are right for me, you know, they might be different numbers for the neighborhood. I might buy a little bit better in that one, a little bit less than that one, but it's not necessarily three, two or two, one, you know, if it's real odd configuration, like one, one or something real small, if I got plenty of comps in that neighborhood, then I'll do the deal and the price is right. Um, but I'll do mobile homes, single family, industrial, commercial, anything the numbers fit right. Cause I'm, since since I was an appraisal, I'm pretty well versed with pretty much every asset class. You know, there's I'm not pros at them by any means, but I know them well enough to feel comfortable doing them. That's awesome, dude. Or for example, this one behind me. This one is kind of an outlier. It's um two acres. It's a pretty expensive property. The ARV is like six hundred. Uh, it's a major flip, and I'm actually doing the renovation on this one because I bought it for myself. And I might sell it, but I guess to answer your question, typically I'm kind of like in the high 100s to mid 200s mm -hmm. with a few outliers. Like I contracted one yesterday that ARV is 400. It's a nice house. So if yeah. the numbers work, we'll do the deal. You do. Yep. Yeah. But I, I feel like I'm in the same spot. I sit in that probably, mine are closer, probably, I don't know, 80 to 110. Um, but I've done, done larger on some short term rentals and uh, mobile home parks. So, uh, again, it boils down to the numbers. You know, I've talked yeah. to guys who do multi-million dollar projects and it's all numbers. It's just a bigger number. Right? So, and yeah. acquiring more capital. How do you choose whether you're going to hotel a property or whether you're going to fully renovate it and sell it? Well, you know, right now that that's a little bit tougher to answer. Uh, for example, I contracted one this past week that is super clean really just needs to be cleaned out, uh, a good wipe down. And it's like 40 cents on the dollar. And it's like a two 2010 build, I think. So it's a fairly new house. It just doesn't need a lot of love. Like it's in great shape. Mm -hmm. It's a really big house, but it's in a super good area. 
It didn't need any major repairs. It's got a dimensional roof on it. AC's good. Everything's good. So I could wholesale it very easily, but I know that it would be a real, a real awesome deal if I put it on the MLS. So that one's just like walked into it and I said, this is a hotel no brainer. Um, I'm happy to mess with it. It's not a lot of headaches. Yep. So I have another one that's three units. It's a little bit further than I usually like to go. I don't want to mess with it as much. So I'm trying to move the contract on it. It's pretty clean, but it needs a lot of updates. So, mm-hmm. and then when it comes to the flips, really it just comes down to, do I have the time to do it? Do I like the area? And how invasive is it? Like how time intensive is it? Yeah. And uh, is it foundation? Is it just cosmetic, purely cosmetics? And, and do I know that I can move it based on the data really fast for a lot more on MLS? Interesting. That's cool. Would do you think that you will ever uh, start building a buy and hold portfolio? Yes. Yeah, so actually this year when all the kind of took place, I started thinking, you know what? I bought plenty of property, you know, bought a ton last year. And I'm to the point, you know, financially and in the position of a business where I have, so I have a small team who work with me. They're working on, you know, I guess kind of that transaction stuff just based on where they are in their career. And I'm working on more of the long term. So I'm probably going to dive into a lot more owner finance stuff, creating notes. Um, as opposed to handling tenants because my life's already pretty busy with growing the team and everything. And even though I could be the management company, know how to manage them. So I have some short-term rental stuff that it does not operate as a short-term rental, but has the potential to, or good potential to. Um, and I might convert a couple of those to short-term rentals, but this year my focus is buying holds, uh, with predominantly focusing on creating seller. So you will act as the lender is what you're saying. Will you do, so you're saying you'll do buy or uh, rent to own type of contracts? Yeah, basically kind of, I mean, well, true owner finance. So there will be a you will do. transfer. Okay. You will do yeah. true owner finance. Um, I just won't be managing the tenant. Now is your strategy for this to buy uh, still undervalued distressed properties, put a little bit of love in them? Yeah. You know, I, what's funny is I talk about this often, but I've never, I don't buy off the MLS. Right? And so since I'm in that groove and I have the business that operates and we source distressed properties or discounted properties, I just don't see any reason to not utilize that same, you know, uh, path of property, uh, incoming properties. And just keep them for myself. That's, I mean, you, I, you have the system in place. Like you already yeah. have, that's what a lot of people struggle with is how do I generate these leads? You've got the hard part done. Now it's right. just saying, all right, I'm going to keep these for myself versus I'm going to yeah. flip them and make a buck. Yeah. And I can pick, you know, fortunately, which ones I want to keep. And that's kind of a agreement I have with my team too. You know, I want to see them, you know, be very successful. So if a property comes across our plate, we look at it for, we look at it with what's the best strategy here. Yeah. Do we need a hotel this and put it in the business and a wholesale and put it in the business? Do I really want to keep it? Am I going to make a executive decision and pay pay my teammates, you know, a handsome wholesale fee and keep the property? Just depends on on uh, what we want to do with the property at the time. I'm excited to hear about it. You have to keep me updated. Um you know oh, on, yeah. on how the buy and hold portfolio goes. I think you'll enjoy it. It's not as exhilarating. As flipping uh, or wholesaling, obviously you yeah. get that hit of dopamine uh, when you make that when you make that buck. But I, I promise you, you look back in two to three years with these buy and holds, and you'll be like, "This is pretty freaking awesome." Yeah, that would be. Yeah, I'm excited for you. Cool, man. Well, hey, I really appreciate you uh, you being on here with us today, and uh, we'll talk soon, brother. All right. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me. All right, dude.